So um, when I got the title of this presentation, um, I really wasn't sure how best to look at um, presenting this and how, what, what sort of things we should look at and what our priority should be. Um, because obviously postnatal care of women with preeclampsia can really include lots of things to do with general postnatal care because obviously women with preeclampsia are more likely to be induced, they're more likely to have instrumental deliveries, more likely to have cesarean sections and indeed more likely to need healthcare advice for afterwards um, by virtue of the fact that they have, a, have had preeclampsia which of itself probably um, puts them at uh, a cardiovascular risk down the line. So really the lecture is very broad and all-encompassing but I decided to try and um, make it a little bit more specific um, and focused on the day itself. Uh, but obviously, as I say, any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. I know you have um, had a lot of talk already today about the NICE guidelines, and indeed, they do a very good follow-up algorithm uh, for patients who've had preeclampsia. But I focused a lot of my presentation on the HSE and Institute of Obstetrics and Gynecology guideline uh, on, on hypertension and uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclamptic toxemia. Um, and that guideline is available online through the HSE clinical program and the HSE website, um, but it is actually due for revision. Um, and uh, I think there are some changes that can be integrated to that over time, uh, but that guideline is available for review. And that in conjunction with the NICE guidelines really gives quite a comprehensive review of how to manage patients in the postnatal period. There are a couple of basics uh, which have probably been emphasized already, <laughs> Ultimately, the treatment for preeclamptic toxemia is delivery. Postnatal management is very much dependent on the severity of PET. We all know women who have come for an antenatal visit of 37 and a half weeks, had a blood pressure reading of 180 on 100, brought into the antenatal ward, four hourly blood pressures, um, still quite significantly elevated, and uh, she has a VE, she's favourable, um, she has proteinuria and the decision is made to proceed to delivery. She has her labour induced, it's all very uneventful, and she never has a high blood pressure reading again. So obviously that happens. But by the same token, there's women who have a lot of postnatal issues with hypertension. So really, their management depends on how they are afterwards. And in general, um, if their blood pressure has been quite long in evolution, it's probably going to take longer to disappear than somebody who has a very acute presentation um, unless they're very premature, if they have an acute presentation early on in pregnancy, they're more likely to, to have, a, have postnatal symptoms, but an acute presentation late in the third trimester, those women will probably recover quite quickly. Um, within the Republic of Ireland context, we would say that women should be retained for inpatient um, monitoring of their blood pressure for three postnatal days. Now, I know that is different in the, in the North, it's def different in the UK, where there is comprehensive um, community midwifery care but in general terms in the absence of good community midwifery care patients should be retained as inpatients because obviously the risk of eclampsia does last um, through the postnatal period um, and consequently it is safer in our current um, organisational system that, the, that we would monitor patients as inpatients for three postnatal days um, and if they are discharged on medication it's also important that we need follow-up uh, postnatal care in this country uh, is one of the Cinderella specialties. Nobody's really 100% interested in it. There's obviously pockets of absolutely excellent um, community midwifery care or ac hospital access services, but there's also huge numbers of women who, have any po who, regardless of what postnatal problem they have, they can have difficulty seeking care uh, because we're also focused on dealing with the acute problem and dealing with the numbers that we have to deal with. So it is very important if as a doctor or a midwife we're discharging somebody that we do have their appropriate follow-up care documented and um, written down, given to them, make sure they're aware of it. And with also a fallback, you know, if we're telling them to go to their GP, if they can't access their GP, that they would come to an emergency room in a hospital for follow-up. So the key recommendations from the HSE guidelines pertinent to postnatal care would recommend a comprehensive postnatal care package in an appropriate location. That sounds very glamorous and sounds like a special clinic, but really what it just means is an organised way of seeing people postnatally. Uh, this is a relatively small number of people um, who need to be followed up postnatally um, in the acute sense. So 
we, we should be able to provide that care. In addition, the other thing that they emphasise is the importance of an appropriately sized <coughs> cuff. Um, obviously, that's very relevant um, and, and very much thought of when patients are being seen, say, in a daycare unit or whatever, antenatally. But when they're discharged and they're told just to come back to an emergency room or come, go to their GP for a blood pressure after four days, sometimes the incorrect uh, cuff size will be used, which obviously can have an impact on their readings. So it is very important that um, if their mid-arm circumference is above a certain uh, measurement, that a large cuff is used. And indeed, we would even say to be prescriptive if you are discharging somebody and they, they should use a large cuff, for measuring their blood pressure and you're not going to be the person seeing them back to actually write down recommend use of large cuff. Fluid restriction is important postnatally for people who have had significant uh, hypertension and um, those women should have their fluids restricted to 80 mils an hour and it's important that the, all their fluids are counted together because what can sometimes happen is that the, um, the crystalloids are, are restricted to 80 mils an hour but it's forgotten that they're on 125 mils of oxytocin and they're also on their their magnesium sulfate and maybe they're getting some antibiotics so everything should be restricted to 80 mils an hour as i say it's okay for people who have um, relatively mild preeclampsia but somebody who has significant preeclampsia or eclampsia the fluid restriction is vitally important in the postnatal period we try and wean people off methyl dopa uh, because of the psychological impact of methyl dopa and the difficulty that, could be, that people can have in the postnatal period with that uh, so we do try and wean it off um, and in general the preference would be for libetalol and um, nifedipine retard instead of methyl dopa. Now that doesn't mean that it's never used in the postnatal period but if you're starting a medication in the postnatal period or you're adjusting medications it's a good idea to see if you can taper down the methyl dopa and again as I say uh, the take home message is the follow up afterwards. So in terms of postnatal hypertension it is interesting to note, and I think we all see it um, in our clinical practice, that blood pressure may be higher immediately postpartum than either before labour and delivery or during labour and delivery. And sometimes that's very simply explained away by pain from the episiotomy um, and or pain from the section scar or whatever. Uh, so blood pressure may well come up and uh, postnatally. But it's also been shown physiologically that systolic and diastolic blood pressure do increase after the are in line with the physiological changes that happen postpartum and indeed this study by Michael de Sweet's group it's quite old now and um, was quite interesting I mean it's, it's close to 30 years old and it was very very simple it was a group of clinicians who measured somebody's it measured patients blood pressure they never these patients had never had a history of hypertension and they measured the blood pressure in the morning and they measured it in the afternoon just to see what was the physiology over the first few days postpartum. And interestingly, more than one in 10 non-hypertensive women at one point in the postnatal period had diastolic blood pressure of more than 100 millimetres of mercury. So it's not necessarily pathological. It may be part of the postnatal course. Um, but again, I suppose important to identify it if it happens and um, investigate it and treat it as appropriately. This increase in blood pressure postnatally, most of it is just due to the physiological adjustment now that uh, the person is no longer pregnant. So there is a pregnancy associated with vasodilation, as we know, that happens during pregnancy. When they're no longer pregnant, they lose that vasodilation, which causes a return of their blood pressure to normal levels. Um, as well as that, there is extracellular fluid, which is mobilized after somebody delivers. Um, and that's why it is important to watch their fluid balance because they're getting this whole load of extra fluid um, into the, between, moving between the fluid spaces. But again, even in a normal person, that'll cause an adjustment in their blood pressure. They may have had a whole load of fluids during their labor and delivery. Um, and interestingly, um, I always was, was thought to avoid non steroidal anti inflammatories in women who had bad preeclampsia. And I presumed the only reason to do it was because of the potential impact on non steroidal anti inflammatories on platelet function. But interestingly, there are actually studies which show that non steroidal anti inflammatories do increase blood pressure even in uh, non pregnant, healthy young women. So, non steroidal anti inflammatories are something to be avoided or at least 
given with caution and observe, um, observe the impact of them on people with preeclampsia. And as I say, certainly women with low platelets, we should avoid them because of the, the uh, interaction they have with the cyclooxygenase pathway. And as we all know, ergometrine in the postnatal period um, for the third stage or for postpartum hemorrhage is to be avoided in people with significant hypertension unless the benefits outweigh the risks. So women who develop postnatal hypertension for the very first time need to be evaluated by their history. So in, for the most part, people who have postnatal hypertension and they haven't had any antenatal hypertension, um, it will usually be just a variant of preeclampsia. But I suppose we do need to talk to them. We need to make sure they have no other history. Um, and obviously they need to have a general review um, to rule out any other neurological or cardiac or other symptoms which could suggest a disorder other than PET. So that little slide is to remind me that when you hear hoof beats, it's usually horses, um, but every so often it might be zebras. So you just have to um, review the patient and make sure that it's appropriate um, to treat them as a patient with PET rather than something else. One of the zebra conditions is the one at the bottom of the slide there, primary aldosteronism, uh, hyperaldosteronism. Now, I have never seen this condition, but it is a rare cause of postpartum hypertension because pregnancy usually protects a patient from it uh, because of the effects of progesterone. But when progesterone reduces after delivery, they can have significant postpartum hypertension. So as I say, every so often, you'll meet the weird and the wonderful. And it is just important to keep in the back of your mind that the weird and the wonderful exist in order so that um, you'll, you'll identify something weird or wonderful when it presents itself. You may not know the name of it, but what you will be doing is you'll be excluding um, or look, looking at the patient's symptoms and integrating the knowledge that you've got from their history and examination into realising, well, this isn't quite like PET because of X, Y, or Z. So as I say, the weird and the wonderful does happen, not very often, but just keep an eye out for it. In terms of people who do have preeclampsia, and have postnatal hypertension, in general, their blood pressure will resolve pretty quickly. And we've all seen patients who uh, recover from their blood pressure <coughs> either prior to discharge from hospital or relatively soon afterwards. And the average is a couple of weeks, so 16 days plus or minus 9.5 days. So that's somewhere from about one week to three weeks. And that pretty much fits with all our clinical practice. That's what you see. And in general terms, it's I was always taught in college that it should be gone, if it's pregnancy related, it should be gone by six weeks. Uh, but broader studies have said it should, be, um, it should be gone. It's usually gone by 12 weeks. And some cases may take as long as six months to resolve. Now, to be honest, I'd be fairly suspicious of someone who's still hypertensive at four and a half or five months that they have something else going on. But um, allegedly, uh, preeclampsia in certain situations can take slightly longer to resolve. But in general terms, you can reassure patients that for the most part, their hypertension will be gone by three or four weeks postpartum. And if it is not gone, you need to investigate them. Uh, in terms of their postnatal care while they're in hospital, the mainstays would be magnesium sulfate, consideration with regard to their anesthesia and analgesia re requirements, Fluid management is really important, as is antihypertensive management um, when it's needed. And then I just briefly thought we talk about contraception and future pregnancies as well. So in terms of magnesium sulfate, this has probably been spoken about this morning. As you know, it's usually initiated antenatally for seizure prophylaxis in women with severe PET or eclampsia, but it needs to be continued for 24 hours um, after delivery or after their last seizure. And it's always administered within a HDU setting. The recommendation is very much that we use, to use a pre-mixed magnesium solution to avoid medication errors and for the same reason that we deliver it by, via a pump. So again, you're reducing any risk of medication errors. Patient needs to be monitored in a HDU setting while she's um, receiving magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis monitored with pulse oximetry and also a three lead ECG. The respiratory rate is measured. Um, you don't need to do magnesium levels. However, it is important to remember that 97% of magnesium is excreted via the urine. So if the patient has major renal compromise or has significant oliguria, that can lead to toxicity. And in that context, if there's a risk of magnesium sulfate toxicity, there may be a case made for levels um, and indeed it's all the more important to observe for clinical signs of toxicity 
which the easiest one is the respiratory rate. Uh, it is recommended in the HSE clinical guideline that the patient would have four hourly clinical review, but obviously because they're being monitored in a HDU setting, they will have um, continuous uh, monitoring in that context. It is also important to remember that if somebody uh, returns to ward or is in, in a recovery room with an epidural, after, they after the epidural catheter is removed, the patient can get rebound hypertension, um, which may just be related to their, an, an increased analgesia need. But it is just something to watch if somebody is very stable and you're planning to return them to the ward, but they haven't had the epidural removed yet. Some patients will return with an arterial line, um, and it very much depends on the anaesthetist's uh, own wishes and also particular patient characteristics as to whether or not an arterial line will be inserted. The benefit of an arterial line is the invasive blood pressure monitoring which it enables and the other great benefit obviously from the patient perspective is that phlebotomy can be performed from the arterial line. In general terms patients who are unstable will have an arterial line so you come across that when there's a patient with significant hypertension um, and imminent eclampsia on an antenatal ward and is being stabilized for delivery um, and they, the anaesthetist will usually put an arterial line in um, either immediately prior to delivery or uh, prior to transfer to the recovery room. For the same reason, if they have significant hypertension, the invasive blood pressure monitoring is very beneficial. If they don't have very significant hypertension, but you're getting inaccurate um, non-invasive measurements because the patient is very overweight, you may find that um, an arterial line will be beneficial. And if the patient has had a significant postpartum hemorrhage, obviously there are other benefits of having the arterial line in. So not all patients will have an arterial line, but most patients who have severe preeclampsia um, and eclampsia will. And the benefits uh, certainly outweigh the risks and outweigh the discomfort of having the line inserted. Um, CVP monitoring, central venous pressure monitoring, would be done very much in an ICU setting for non-obstetric patients, uh, but in general terms it's very infrequently used in obstetrics um, and indeed the constricted vasculature, the vasoconstriction of pregnancy can actually alter the venous pressures. So purely from a uh, preeclampsia perspective we don't usually use CVP monitoring. Uh, fluid management is one of the things that um, I think often causes problems, particularly for the more junior staff. If you're the student midwife or junior midwife who's keeping an eye on the on the hourly output, or then you're the SHO who's the first person to get the call to say, "Well, this woman's only passed twenty mils of urine," and you're kind of going, "Well, twenty mils? What does that mean?" And in general, um, this algorithm is quite good because it's important that just because the patient's only passed 20 mils in the last hour that we don't launch in and give her an extra litre of, of colloid or whatever because the patient could get significantly overloaded. So it is very important that patients who have had significant PET are fluid restricted because they're going to get a natural diuresis just like every postnatal woman after about two to three postnatal days. So you try and restrict the fluid prior to that and as I say we try and restrict it to about 80 mils an hour, and that includes all the fluids that they're on. So it's a bit laborious, but if you've got somebody who's on a load of stuff, you do need to add it up because 80 mils adds up pretty quickly, and um, particularly if you're adding in triple antibiotics or whatever as well. Um, and as I say, a little bit of oxytocin, it all kind of adds up. Um, and in terms of the output, we don't jump after one low urinary output. In general, it is recommended that we would summate the output over a four hour period. So somebody comes back to the ward, they've got 20 mils urine output. The following hour, they've got another 20 mils. The following hour, they get up to 30 mils. And the following hour, they get up to 40 mils. That's fine. Their output is more than 80 mils over the four hours. And that's fine. It doesn't matter that a couple of the readings were a lot lower than that. Um, however, if after that four hours, there is still a significant oliguria. There's a couple of things to think about. Obviously, as I said, because magnesium sulfate is very is is um, for the most part excreted and metabolized through the kidneys, it is important that um, you're just cognizant of the risk of magnesium toxicity. So if they are ver very oliguric, they need a clinical review to make sure that they don't have um, magnesium toxicity. And the other thing is then you need to work out how you're going to deal with this oliguria. So what the recommendation is, 
that you would actually do an input output and look at what the imbalance is. So if you add up their input and their output and you, fi you find that their input exceeds their output by more than 750 mils so that you feel they're very overloaded over the previous 24 hours, then you give them a diuretic. All right, so it does seem a little bit counterintuitive. You have this person that you're really focusing on only giving a small amount of fluids to, and then their output's poor, and you really try, you give them a diuretic, and you have this feeling that you're really kind of squeezing a dry sponge. Um, but then if they get a good diuresis, you do need to replace that because of the intravascular, extravascular fluid shift, you do need to replace that with colloid. If, however, when you add up their input and their output over the previous 24 hours, and the input is, is less than 750 mils more than the output, um, then just give them the colloid. So this algorithm is within the national guidelines, and it is, it's the kind of thing that actually you generally need to look at um, for a, in front of a particular patient, because obviously you want to make sure their fluid balance, particularly if they've bad PET, is really very critical to their recovery. So it's the sort of thing you don't want to get wrong. But it is important that we just don't load a load of crystalloid, a load of Hartmann's or whatever. You know, when I was an intern, if they told you somebody had low urine output, you just said, oh yeah, put up 1,000 mils of Hartmann's. That's not what you do for somebody with PET because um, very quickly they can get, um, they can get uh, very, very unwell rapidly with, an, with <coughs> significant fluid overload. So it's either frusamide or it's colloid, depending on what the balance is. Um, and uh, it's just important to, to realize the, the critical nature of fluid management for women with significant PET. Obviously, somebody who comes back to the ward who, as I say, has been induced at 38 and a half weeks because of a bit of PET, fluid management is important with her, but not as absolutely critical. Um, and in general terms, what we would do is measure their output uh, for the first 24 hours or so and um, keep an eye on it in conjunction with her hypertension. You're obviously going to be keeping an eye on her blood pressure uh, for a matter of two to three days, um, but her fluid management is not as critical as long as she's generally well. In terms of antihypertensives, we aim to keep the blood pressure uh, somewhere between 130 and 150 on 80 to 100. And as I say, the preference is to start treatment, if you're starting it postnatally, with libetalol, or indeed if there's somebody who, who has been hypertensive prior to pregnancy and then, um, is, then is changed, say, to something like methyl dopa or libetalol during pregnancy, but you want to put them back to their, their uh, previous hypertensive regime, the best thing is to put them back to that in the, in the early in the postnatal period. And most hypertensives, antihypertensives are safe with breastfeeding. Um, and obviously your pharmacy can give you more information. But most antihypertensives, including ACE inhibitors, are safe. Um, in general, in our practice, we start with libetalol and we add nifedipine as a second line treatment. Obviously, it depends on, on um, the, the particular location and your comfort with particular drugs. As I say, that would be our routine one. And in general, that would be what's in general use. We try and restrict methyl dopa use, as I say, in the postnatal period, um, because in general, libetalol is better tolerated. Um, and the doses you can get up to with these medications are really quite high. And often we give um, almost homeopathic doses. We're giving really quite small doses, particularly of nifedipine. Um, so in general, we can, we can increase those doses um, as required in order to keep the blood pressure less than 130 to 150 over 80 to 100. So it doesn't have to be, I suppose when we're in college, we're all taught kind of 120 on 80. It doesn't have to be 120 on 80. Um, but as I say, you don't want it to be 200 on 110 or whatever. So what I thought was, I just give you three brief case reports of slightly different um, presentations of preeclampsia and hypertension um, that I've come across over recent months. So the first of these was 35 year old primogravid who was 110 kilograms, so had a significantly elevated body mass index at booking. And indeed, her booking blood pressure was uh, borderline at 136 on 89. That being said, some of that may have been related to anxiety or whatever, because her blood pressure was fine then throughout the pregnancy until 33 weeks and two days. When she presented to an antenatal visit with blood pressure of 170 on 100, she had a trace of protein, was admitted for monitoring. She had a 24-hour urine collection. Um, which showed borderline significant proteinuria, 
And she was started on Labetalol and because she was 33 weeks, she was given prophylactic dexamethasone. So the kind of working diagnosis, because she had a scan showing a well-grown baby, was that this was probably a variant of pregnancy-induced hypertension and maybe developing a little bit of superimposed PET. But um, the sort of multi-system disorder causing growth restriction and stuff wasn't evident in this patient. However, as the days went on, um, her requirement for antihypertensives increased quite significantly. Um, and ultimately, she was on both labetalol and nifedipine. She then became quite symptomatic, blood pressure of 170 on 102. She had dizziness um, and some visual symptoms. She was very edematous. She had a headache and she had brisk reflexes. And she underwent an emergency cesarean section and was delivered of a male infant weighing just over two and a half kilos at less than 34 weeks. This was a well-grown baby who went to the unit only for four days um, and was back with mum on the postnatal ward prior to discharge. Um, in terms of afterwards, she went to HDU because she was on magnesium sulfate. We had to be careful to make sure we gave her the appropriate INAHEP dose um, according to her weight, which was 9,000 international units, because obviously she was an overweight woman who'd had a cesarean section, who we were keeping fluid restricted and she had hypertension. So she had a number of risk factors um, for a uh, thromboembolic event. So we had to make sure we didn't make her any sicker than she already was. She required labetalol straight away after delivery. So even after delivery, things took a while to settle. At two weeks, she was reduced, her blood, her blood pressure um, medication was reduced from 400 TDS to 400 twice a day. But then she came into our emergency room concerned because she was quite dizzy. And actually at that point, her blood pressure was probably pretty low for her, 113 on 62. So her blood pressure medication was reduced to labetalol, 200 milligrams twice a day. And indeed a week later, her blood pressure medication was discontinued. And you can see at four weeks, the blood pressure wasn't quite the whole 120 on 80 business. It was 123 on 92. But by five weeks, the blood pressure was back to absolutely plumb normal. Now, the important thing for this woman was she was 110 kilograms when she booked for her first pregnancy. And um, when she's having another pregnancy, she obviously has that risk plus a PET and um, pregnancy-induced hypertension risk plus a previous section risk. So it is important to talk to that woman about uh, sort of health promotion aspects of her life in terms of reducing weight and optimizing um, outcome for future pregnancies. So the next lady was similar, but a little bit different in terms of the multi-system disorder. So this girl was interesting in that she was 24, 25. She'd had her first baby in Saudi Arabia where she was from in 2008, um, so six years previously. This baby was born at 38 weeks. He was normal delivery. He weighed 2.8 kilos, which for this woman was probably pretty normal weight because she was a small Saudi Arabian woman. And this woman transferred her care from Saudi Arabia to Ireland at 31 weeks and six days because her husband was taking up um, English tuition here. So she had had allegedly uneventful antenatal care in Saudi Arabia. She came to us just before 32 weeks um, on a Friday afternoon for a booking visit and her blood pressure was 130 on 74 and nothing of major concern from her perspective. But when we scanned her, the baby was small sonographically. Normal like her volume and moving around, but certainly small and much smaller than we would have expected just for kind of constitutional smallness related to her, her ethnicity. So we arranged for her to come back. That was a Friday afternoon. We arranged for her to come back on the Wednesday um, for formal assessment of fetal size. And the night before, she came into the emergency room. So that was at 32 weeks and four days with a headache, edema, epigastric pain. And she had all the hallmark signs of severe preeclampsia. Her blood pressure was 153 on 96. She had plus three of protein. She'd elevated uric acid. She had brisk reflexes. She had clonus. And she herself spoke Arabic, but her husband said she feels like she has the jitters, which is uh, probably a, um, a quite a good, a good way of describing imminent eclampsia. She, the plan was to stabilise her um, and then uh, review with a view to delivery, but actually the CTG was non-reassuring. So she had an immediate cesarean section. And actually, I just noticed this morning, I got the weight wrong. I said 1.8, the baby was actually 1.18 kilograms. The baby was very small, really, for 32 weeks. Um, and that baby has continued to do well in the intensive care unit. She was initially normotensive. So for the first three days or so, she didn't require any medication. But gradually then, 
her um she developed postnatal hypertension and on day four she required she was requiring libitalol 400 milligrams tds by day 10 however she was able to reduce that to twice a day and i saw her yesterday three weeks postpartum and we've reduced we've discontinued her antihypertensives altogether. So her um, pathology was much more multi-system in that the placenta was involved because the baby was growth restricted and um, it, that it, the growth restriction was actually presenting before the hypertension. So I suppose it shows the different types of hypertension that exist. And the other interesting thing, um, I have never directly asked this woman, whether her husband is the father of her other child, but I presume because of her ethnic origin that he is, and um, certainly dad and son have a great relationship, and it certainly doesn't look like a second relationship or anything like that, but as I say, I've never directly asked her, but that is unusual that she, her first baby was 2.8 kilos and no hypertension, and then she has severe preeclampsia, so that means don't move from Saudi Arabia to Ireland at 31 weeks gestation. It obviously sets you over the edge altogether. And this last one, is a bit of a um, zebra rather than a horse, this one here. So this girl is 34 years old and she had an uneventful antenatal course other than she presented at her first booking visit and before she'd perhaps even given her name to the secretary, she said that she wanted to have a cesarean section. Um, so that's all the midwife was asking her about her past history and she just said, oh, all I want to have is a cesarean section. So anyway, that was her major priority was to have a cesarean section. She did develop, I'm not sure because of that or in spite of that, she had palpitations during pregnancy. Um, and she actually was, they must have been quite troublesome because she saw a cardiologist during pregnancy. Um, but the cardiologist uh, did an echo and an ECG. There was nothing to worry about, did TFTs and they were all fine and sent her off on her merry way. She developed pregnancy-induced hypertension with no proteinuria from 29 weeks gestation and required a relatively low dose of libetalol to keep things under control. At 38 weeks, however, she came for an antenatal visit again on a Friday. It always happens on a Friday. And she was due to have her elective cesarean section on the Monday when she was 39 weeks. And on the Friday, she had proteinuria. Um, so she was, it, the plan was she was going to be admitted and observed and have her section on the Monday, but she could have it um, over the weekend if needs be. And actually her um, liver function came back as my, a mild transaminitis. Her uric acid was increased. Her platelets were fine. She had brisk reflexes and it was just decided on balance. Why wait another two days? Um, and she had her cesarean section of a little boy weighing 3.59 kilos and there was a true knot in the cord which she said was mother's intuition showing that she shouldn't have had a normal delivery so good thing we delivered her by section and um, the placental histology was fine and there was nothing the, the pathologist actually looked at the knot you know they looked for a clot either side of it and there was nothing to worry about but she herself still holds true to the thing that she knew that there was a knot there and that's why she was having a cesarean section Interestingly, her blood pressure was absolutely, well, not absolutely fine. Her blood pressure was pretty much the way it had been antenatally for the first few postnatal days. But then almost um, out of the blue here on the uh, third postnatal day, her blood pressure was rising very significantly. 230 on 93, 210 on 90. So really, really high blood pressure. Um, her libetalol was increased and you can see it looked like we were getting a handle on it. This was day five and we were almost thinking of sending her home. Her blood pressure was 130 on 90 and she was on her various medications. Um, but she then mentioned that she feels quite sweaty when her blood pressure is high. And um, one of my colleagues is incredibly intelligent and he said, sure, look, let's send the urine for catecholamines. So lo and behold, she has a pheochromocytoma. So her noradrenaline and her free normethanephrine were both very significantly high. So we drop kicked her out of the rotunda faster than you could say anything because really when you uh, read anything about pheochromocytomas in pregnancy, it's basically stay away from them. So luckily she was delivered. So that meant that our colleagues in the general hospital were happy to take her. And her, she went on, had a CT and then she had an MRI which showed an extra adrenal pheochromocytoma. So most pheochromocytomas are in the adrenal gland, but 10% of them are outside the adrenal gland. And this woman's um, pheochromocytoma was actually in a ganglion of nerves, um, adjacent but not in the adrenal gland itself. Um, and pheochromocytomas are pretty rare. The instance is one in uh, 50,000 pregnancies, 
But there is a significantly increased maternal and fetal mortality. And had we known about this antenatally, we probably would have had hypertension ourselves, but we didn't know about it, so that was good. So she had surgery three weeks postnatally, and by her six weeks check, her blood pressure was absolutely normal. And this woman should have no further problems. So this one is one of the zebras. Most of the PET, the postnatal PET that you see, would be more like the first or second patient. But I guess you just need to have it in the back of your mind that every so often there will be something that you need to keep an extra close eye on. Um, in terms of contraception afterwards, because it is important to close the loop and make sure that even when this patient is fully recovered from her PET and she's off all her anti-hypertensives, um, that you advise her appropriately about contraception. So in general terms, the combined oral contraception um, is relatively contraindicated. Certainly you need to delay for at least eight weeks and you should certainly never initiate it in someone who has persistent hypertension. Now that being said, the woman with the pheochromocytoma, there isn't any contraindication to her having combined oral contraception because her problem is gone. Um, she's very different, say, to the first woman who probably has a bit of um, a bit of kind of you know essential hypertension or whatever, and giving her combined oral contraception is probably a far greater sin than, as I say, giving it to somebody who has a different pathology. Uh, but even in the absence of combined oral contraception, obviously Cerazet, progesterone only contraception will be safe. Depo-Provera, Marina, or Implanon, and um, so progesterone progesterone based. Um, anti or, um, con contraceptives are, are entirely appropriate. The other thing that you're going to talk to somebody about at their six weeks check is their increased risk of recurrent preeclampsia down the line. So most of these women, they're having their first baby. Most people don't have one baby by choice. So most people will be planning another baby. Um, and it depends really on the nature of their particular symptoms and signs as to what their recurrence risk is. So we all know the woman who has severe health syndrome at 26 weeks is much more likely to have a recurrent problem in her next pregnancy. The woman that we've been kind of talking about, she's 38 and a half weeks and has a bit of hypertension and proteinuria and gets induced and has an uneventful delivery, her recurrence risk is much lower. So the earlier the preeclampsia has started, the more likely she is to get it again. Um, but at least forewarned is forearmed and those people can be triaged appropriately in their next pregnancy for monitoring their blood pressure and as I say, reviewed um, early on in pregnancy with a view to aspirin um, and all the other various things that, that Sharon probably spoke to you about. The other thing just to tell them um, is later life. Um, and certainly from very early on, from the 19th century, they knew that there was an association between preeclampsia and hypertension and renal disease down the line. Um, and certainly there's a higher instance of hypertension in patients who have a history of PET in their first pregnancy, and particularly if they have recurrent PET, so they get PET every pregnancy, um, or indeed they have severe early onset PET, those women have a greater hypertensive risk. Uh, when the various studies have analysed it in more detail, certainly the longer you follow up people for, it makes sense, a bit like gestational diabetes. Um, most people who have gestational diabetes won't have developed type 2 diabetes if you only follow them up for a year, whereas if you follow them up for 30 years, you're going to see much more of it. It's the same with hypertension. The longer you follow them up for, the more likely you're going to see that people who've had PET will, will develop hypertension down the line. Um, the various meta-analyses have concluded that there is a relative risk of hypertension in women who have had PET of about three to four times the background risk. Um, and certainly people who are followed up, as I say, for a protracted period of time, like for 25 years after preeclampsia, um, they are more likely to have um, significant hypertension down the line. So they say that um, people who have had hypertension in pregnancy, um, about 50%, close to 50% of them will have hypertension at their next pregnancy or at their, in their 50s. Um, so it is something to follow up. Uh, the, the NICE guidelines are quite good on the health promotion aspects. Um, and uh, in terms of the British Hypertensive Society, they're a little bit non-specific. They say to advise patients about cardiovascular risk, optimize their cardiovascular health, and they just say that they should have regular blood pressure monitoring. So they don't say what the interval should be and they don't say what age it should start at. Um, but I guess this is just something you tell patients and you make sure that, um, that they realize that 
preeclampsia, even though it's finished now and their pregnancy has come to an end, um, there may be, may be an impact down the line, so they just need to be monitored. So in conclusion, preeclampsia in the postnatal period, like in the antenatal period, is a variable condition. It's important to be prepared postnatally and therefore in the Republic of Ireland context, as I say, these patients are not candidates for early transfer home unless you can have very robust follow-up mechanisms and you're very happy that um, if they do become hypertensive, it'll be picked up in the community. Um, as I say, you every so often have to think of the zebras um, and not everything is common things are common, but sometimes uncommon things will happen. Um, and obviously in terms of health promotion, look at their cardiovascular risk for the future and give them appropriate advice. You know, we all go to meetings about the impact of BMI and all that, but it's very hard to uh, sit at a six weeks check and tell somebody, you know, the most important thing for you when your baby's not sleeping all night is to go out and lose weight. And that's really what we should be saying. Um, and as I say, particularly, we owe it to our patients like that first one whose weight was 110 kilograms. She really should focus on that before she conceives again. Um, and that should have an impact on her cardiovascular health for the future. So thank you very much. Um, I think my email is there. Yes, uh, if anybody has any questions, you can either ask me now or if they're very secret and private, feel free to email me. <laughs>